بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين أجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف وجعلنا من أعوانه وأنصاره We had some discussions about the beginning of Surah Luqman up to verse number 23. kafara So we will resume from this part of Surah Luqman and inshallah we may be able to finish Surah in this course. Uh, to give you some idea about the previous verses, I read from the some few verses before that and then we concentrate on our you know discussion today. And I hope you have uh, copies of Quran with you. If not today, you know if you could bring for the other days. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألم تروا أن الله سخر لكم ما في السماوات وما في الأرض وأسبغ عليكم نعمه ظاهرة وباطنة ومن الناس من يجادل في الله بغير علم ولا هدى ولا كتاب منير الله سبحانه وتعالى says that are you not aware that Allah has made whatever is in the skies and whatever is there in the earth for your benefit and they are subservient to you? And Allah has bestowed upon you His blessings, His gifts, whether they are obvious, manifest, or they are hidden. But there are among the people a group who dispute about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while they have no knowledge, no guidance, and no enlightening book. They are deprived from all this. And when وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمُ اتَّبِعُوا مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهِ these people who have no knowledge, no guidance, no access to that book, when they are told to follow what Allah has revealed, qalu, in response to this invitation to get benefit from this book, their reply is, بَلْ نَتَّبِعُ مَا وَجَدْنَا عَلَيْهِ آبَاءَنَا They say, we rather, we would like to follow the way of our fathers and our forefathers. So instead of having any argument to show that they have some sort of self-sufficiency, for example, instead of saying that we have our own book, we have our own knowledge, we have our own guidance, they said, no, we just want to follow the way of our fathers. Because Allah says they didn't have any of such things. So that was the only thing that they could find, you know, as an excuse. And then Allah says, أَوَلَوْ كَانَ الشَّيْطَانُ يَدْعُوهُمْ إِلَىٰ عَذَابِ السَّعِيرِ Would they say the same thing? Even if it is known that it is Iblis, it is the Satan that invites them. Either their fathers or themselves or both. Because this can be referred to three, one of these three things. And the Satan is inviting them towards punishment. So no one can say, I follow my fathers, even though they are taking me to the path of Satan. And we discussed about this, and we had just one session, I think, on this uh, particular subject, that what is the view of Islam about following our fathers, about following our customs and tradition. And we said Islam is not against 
following your customs or tradition or the way of your fathers. But what is important is that you must check them against your standards. If they are not against your standards, against criteria that you have learned from revelation, then that's fine. You follow them, you can have your own tradition, your style of, you know, we gave example of dressing, of making food or whatsoever. But if there is something wrong in your custom or in your tradition or whatsoever, then you must give priority to revelation, to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm not going to repeat that discussion. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to two groups of people. The first group are believers, good people. And Allah says, وَمَنْ يُسْلِمْ وَجْهَهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَهُوَ مُحْسَنْ فَقَدْ اسْتَمْسَكَ بِالْعُرْوَةِ الْوُثْقَى وَإِلَى اللَّهِ عَاقِبَةُ الْأُمُورِ Those who turn their face towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who submit themselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, while they are doing good acts, they perform amal saleh good deeds. These people are those who have uh, taken firmly the strongest handhold of faith or love for Allah or Velaya, as you know, has been differently interpreted. But, but all of this can be correct. Al Urwatul Wuthqa means the strongest handhold. So these are the people who have been able to uphold to that handhold. And to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala returns everything and to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the end of everything. Up to now we have discussed. This is where we want to begin. So one group of the people are believers. Those whom we talked about in the verse number 22. وَمَنْ يُسْلِمْ وَجْحَوْ إِلَى اللَّهِ Now, quite opposite are those people who insist on continuing their own way, their own style of life. They don't want to get any benefit from the teachings of the prophets, especially the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, So they behave in the way as if no prophet was sent to them. Even sometimes these people become even worse. Not only they continue the same way that they were doing before the prophet was sent, sometimes they even become worse. Why? Because at least before the prophet came, they could somehow have some excuse. They could say, okay, we didn't know the truth. It was not clear for us what to do. And now, because they insist on going astray, their darkness of the heart will become even more. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that the Quran, which is a cure and treatment for all disease, the same Qur'an will not increase for the unjust people, for the oppressors, except loss. وَلَا يَزِيدُ الظَّالِمِينَ إِلَّا خَسَارًا If a good alim, for example, goes to a city for tabliq, and some people listen to him, and some people do not listen to him, those who do not listen to that alim would be in a state worse than the estate before that alim went there. Because now they have no excuse. Now it is their arrogance. In the past maybe it was ignorance, but now it's arrogance. And arrogance is worse than ignorance. Okay? So when the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was given this mission by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to invite these people towards the right path. The reaction of these people was to insist on kufr, on being disbeliever. 
And naturally, this made the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, very sad. You know, if you are a good teacher and you go to teach people and students are so lazy and stupid that they don't learn anything, you would be very sad. Say, I am here to teach you, but instead of learning from me, you are just, for example, you know, playing and, for example, listening to your, uh, you know, for example, MP3 player or whatsoever in the class, and you are not listening to me. So what is the point? That teacher who has great interest in teaching would not say, okay, I am being given my salary. It's not my business, whether you learn or not. Every month I receive my salary and that's okay. The Prophet would not say, okay, I am receiving my reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of course, the Prophet is not receiving anything from us. He's receiving his reward from Allah. But still, because he has this interest for guiding people, so he would be very sad. And this is what, why we have in many du'as, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you forgive me, you will make your prophet happy. If you let me be with the good people, if you let me enter your heaven, you will first of all make your prophet happy. Okay? So, one of the natural consequences of insistence of these people on Kof was that the prophet was very sad. And you know, in many verses of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself gives some, you know, sort of comfort to the Prophet and says, don't worry, you have done your part, you have done your best. And now you must know that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself wanted to guide these people, he would have done it by force. But Allah wants people to be guided and then it's up to them. So don't worry, don't make yourself too sad. Okay? This is mentioned here as well. وَمَنْ كَفَرَ فَلَا يَحْزُنْكَ كُفْرُهُ Those who disbelieve, those who insist on going astray, do not let their kufr, their disbelief, make you sad. Of course, this does not mean that the Prophet should not be sad. It means that sad to the extent that you feel frustrated and you feel that there is no hope in guiding people and you would feel, you know, despair of guiding the people. And this is very important that we shouldn't always be concerned just with reward because sometimes the mentality of many good, you know, people, many good mu'mineen is that they are only concerned with sawab, just reward. They are not that much concerned about the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, about Islam, about Muslims. They are just after, you know, reward, like merchants, like businessmen who are after just some, you know, gains. But for us, the priority is, first of all, of course, to look after ourselves, and then look after Muslims, and especially those who are closer to us, and also to share the teachings of Islam to the people of the world. And reward is something would be in the second place. Of course, we are in need of Allah's reward. But we should not just think about rewards. Sometimes, you know, people ask, this is my idea. I don't know if you are happy with this. Think about it. And if you have, you know, maybe some question, we can discuss about it. I think there is a difference between reward and between the actual impact of an act on your salvation and on your spirit. For example, we all know that if we recite Surah Tawheed three times, the reward would be equal to recitation of the whole Quran. Isn't it? This is very famous. Okay, so can people say, now we leave the Qur'an aside, 
just we make Surah Al-Qulhuwallah Ahad very beautifully and we recite Surah Al-Qulhuwallah Ahad. And the reward is the same, even more. Because if you recite Quran from the beginning up to end, it takes you, for example, 30 hours. If you do it in Tartil, a standard Tartil, it takes you 30 hours. So if you spend these 30 hours on recitation of Surah Al-Qulhuwallah Ahad, if you are a good businessman, you will do that. So, how many times you can recite Surah Qul Huwa Allah Ahad? Maybe 3,000 times, maybe more. So, you would say, okay, so the result is better. So, why should we bother ourselves to recite whole Quran? But I'm saying that the impact of recitation of whole Quran on your heart cannot be achieved by recitation of Surah Qul Huwa Allah Ahad three times. The reward may be given, but the impact is different. Or another example. We say that if you have good intention, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you as if you have done the act. Okay? For example, you have the intention of going for ziyarah. But a friend of you comes to your, for example, room, and you think that you must be hospitable and, you know, so you cannot go to haram, but you had this intention. So Allah will reward you. Okay? For every person, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives what he has intended to do or she has intended to do as reward. Okay? So you have the reward. But would you be the same as you if you had actually visited haram and shrine? The reward is there. But would your feeling and your state of heart would be the same? I said, this is not something you, you, know, you need to accept from me. This is my idea. Maybe I'm wrong. But this is the way that I understand. That we cannot only be concerned with reward. We must be concerned with the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And reward can be one indication, not all indication, of Allah's pleasure. Okay? There are different things that we need to consider. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Prophet that don't be too sad if you see that these people insist on going astray. This is very important. That you must know, of course you know, but you must remember that, and they must know that they are not able to escape from our control, from our knowledge, from our authority. They will all return to us. It's very important. You know, like a teacher that tells to the students who don't work hard that there would be an exam, final exam, and I am the one who will mark your papers. So if you are not listening to me, then you will suffer. So Allah says, Although you have been given some chance, some opportunity to freely exercise what you, you know, find interesting to you, what you find, you know, acceptable to you, whatever. But you, Prophet, must remember this, and these people must know this, that they all will return to us. Elayna marji'uhum. This is very important. If we know that we return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if we know that we have been created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and now we return. Because the concept of return means that that was also your destination port, uh, sorry, departure point. Because in Arabic, when we say roju, or in English, when we say return, it means that some place or, you know, some point that you were there in the beginning and now you are going back. Okay? As we say, you know, inna lillahu inna ilayhi raji'un. So it means that we had our departure point with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In a special sense, of course. We are not now separate from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are always with Him. But it's our problem that we may not feel this companion. 
and it may be because of our weaknesses. Anyway, but we have started this journey from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And all people will return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? There is no exception. It's not that only mu'mineen, only good people return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No, all people return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But with the difference that you may return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while Allah is pleased with you. And you may return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while Allah is angry with you. Ya ayyatuha nafsul mutma'inna. Erja'i ila rabbik. O the confident soul. Okay? Return to your Lord. Is it just for the confident soul, for nafsul mutma'inna to return to your Lord? No. What is exclusive to these people is radiyatan marziyya. Return to your Lord while you are happy, you are pleased with whatever Allah planned for you, and Allah is pleased with whatever you have done. Radiyatan marziyya. So we all return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But one difference is that we may return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while we are happy, Allah is happy with us. We may return while we are ourselves very sad, we regret, we are remorseful. We realize that we should have done something else and that would be too late and Allah also would be angry with us. So there is only one of two options. But there is no way to escape from returning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the other difference is that we may return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we die, and that is what will happen to everyone. And it is also possible to return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while you are still alive. This is very important. Why we need to wait till we die and go to Barzakh or to the hereafter, then we return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why not today? Why not just now we return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Allah's hands are open to embrace us. Why we don't now go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You know that Attar, who was a very mystical poet, and he has many books, and one of his famous books is Tazkiratul Awliya, which is about the biographies of the saints, the people who were close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His own life is very interesting. He himself was very ordinary, very simple person. And he was, you know, attar. Attar means someone who sells perfumes, someone who has grocery shop. So once a sage went to him and asked Attar, maybe he had some, you know, intention to shake Attar and, you know, to make some revolution inside the heart of Attar. Anyway, ask Attar, you know, some questions about death, about life, and Attar had no idea. And this person said, it's possible to reach a stage in which life and death for you would be equal. And you would be able to reach a stage in which life and death would be in your control. And Attar was, you know, surprised how life and death can be in your control. How they would be the same for you. So that person just lied, you know, down, lied back on the floor and said, look at me. And then he died. Finished. And Attar was shocked how this person, you know, was in control of his death and how he was, you know, prepared for death. And as I said, maybe that person had a mission, you know, to transfer this to Attar. Anyway, so Attar was changed. 
and he himself became you know mystic and you know a poet a anyway so we can return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before we die and this is what we have in hadith mutu qabla an tamutu die before you die what does it mean does it mean to commit suicide no die before you die means die in the spiritual sense means to get rid of your selfishness your animal you know uh, appetites and lusts and desires before you physically die we all will physically die but it's better to experience this death before that one and if we experience this death before the physical death then that death would not be important for us whether it is early or late it's not important whether it is in my home or in you know for example remote place it's not important for me so they all return to us they return to us not just for example you know to have some you know holidays you know they return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not to have some rest they return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for very serious thing and that is to be judged to go to the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be in the presence of Allah and all the prophets and you know imams and pious people and then being judged it's very difficult you know we wish that even if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to judge us not to inform other people not to inform the prophet about what we have done not to be inform Imam Ali or Lady Fatima Zahra and for some cases Allah does this Allah will keep some of our things exclusive to himself have you noticed this point in Dua al Kumail that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even keeps some of the things hidden from the angels who are responsible for recording our acts so this is their job they must record but still Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps something hidden from them. This is in du'a al-kumal. Rahmatika akhfaita wa bi fadlika satarta. Allah out of his mercy keeps them hidden. So we pray that first of all Allah will forgive all our sins and if God forbid something remains not to disclose it to, you know, to the prophet and imams and you know mu'minin it would be a disaster and I think I am not sure but maybe this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions here to make these people you know very uh, worried and very concerned Allah doesn't say that they will be judged Allah says they will be informed about what they have done it means that these people maybe they are not prepared to be known publicly that they have done you know wrong things they have done crimes and a lot to prevent them from continuing their wrong assets that you will come back to us and we will inform you about what you have done it's not just that we judge we will inform you you know it's very difficult if someone has for example you know committed you know for example 10 acts of murder very you know with cruelty and very badly so that person would be saying please kill me don't you know mention this in the public don't read all the you know things that I have done this is a great punishment just kill me and I want to get rid of but Allah says no first we will inform you and maybe in front of others what you have done 
فانو نبئهم بما عملوا ان الله عليم بذات الصدور truly allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows whatever is hidden in your hearts the chest is the place in which our heart you know lies so when allah says that allah knows what is in the chest means in the hearts now because heart is in our chest yeah so whatever we do whatever we intend even if we don't do allah knows and allah will inform us about that so this is to give some relief or some comfort to the prophet so that the prophet knows of course the prophet knows but you know this is different to hear from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that nothing would be out of allah's control and everything would finally judged by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so if there are some people who are going astray the prophet should not feel you know frustrated that he was not successful it's not his failure it's the failure of those people and it's also a warning for those people themselves so in the same verse allah is doing different things is giving courage to the prophet giving hope to the prophet is giving warning to those people and also it can be a warning for us we should be careful not to have the the same end the same fate as these people and then allah says numatuhum qalilan thumma nadtaruhum ila adhabin ghalil it's not only akhira that is where the outcomes of bad acts of these people are known because some people may say okay so these people have very good life very pleasant life and then only in akhirah they will be judged and punished in this verse allah talks about their life in this world as well allah says numatuhum qalilan thumma nadtaruhum ila adhabin ghalil we give these people some enjoyment some you know benefits some blessings some gifts of course these are not real gifts because the gift is really gift when you appreciate that if you don't appreciate a gift and then you will be asked for that gift and you will be punished then that's not a gift and this is the difference between ni'ma and niqma when can i know that what allah has given me is ni'ma or niqma I cannot by looking at something say this is ni'ma or niqma. Allah has given me a child. Is this child a ni'ma or niqma? I don't know. It depends on me. It can be a ni'ma. It can be something that will cause me to be punished. It depends on me. Of course, Allah gives us a ni'ma, but it's me that turns that to a ni'ma. Okay? Anyway, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives these people you know some blessing some gifts life health maybe money maybe respect good reputation but these are all little no matter whom qalilan so whatever they have is a little is not that much and here there can be two at least two different ways to understand this ayah one is to say that even that they may have lots of things as still it's little in the eyes of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this world is little if you have all the money that exists all the positions that are available all the support of the people in the eyes of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is nothing in the eyes of believers that is nothing you know that a statement of imam ali about a brother in allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa kana li fi ma madha akhun fi allah 
And Imam Ali says, one of the things that made that person great in my eyes was that dunya was little in his eyes. كَانَ يُعْظِمُهُ فِي عَيْنِ سَقَرُ الدُّنْيَا فِي عَيْنِ So even for believers, this world is nothing. So it's not that only Allah takes this world as little. Even for believers, this is nothing. Okay? So, نُمَتَّعُهُمْ قَلِيلًا may mean that whatever they have, because this is something worldly, it's little. Even they may be the richest people, it's little. It's not important. Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives to his enemies sometimes more worldly, you know, blessings because of different reasons. And even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran says that if it was, Allah was not worried that you mu'minin will start doubting, he would have given them much more. He would have made their houses made out of gold. But unfortunately, many more men then would start doubting if we are, you know, on the right path, why these people are, you know, sorry. So Allah made it, you know, lower. But still, this is a policy that Allah may give to his enemies more in this world for different reasons. But still, it is a little. The whole world is small. Okay? But there is another meaning for that. And inshallah, I will explain that tomorrow. وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين